holy mackerel, have you seen what's going on at Stonehenge? There was an archaeological group working in the Stonehenge area, you know, using ground-penetrating radar and looking for whatever might be there in addition to Stonehenge. And uh, I guess there have been other crews there previously, never found anything. But this group goes, they're about ready to pack up, pack it in and go home because they didn't find anything like the other groups. And then all of a sudden, they found this incredible array of rocks, just like the Stonehenge rocks, some up to, what, 10 feet high or higher? A hundred of them or more, arranged in what appears to be a kind of a semicircle around Stonehenge. Now, this is really big stuff. If you want to see more about it, artbell.com. We've got the story up there. It is just today breaking. Other news, I guess, almost worth noting. It has been a summer of chaotic activity politically. We've got Donald Trump. We've got a socialist, Bernie Sanders, ripping up uh, Hillary. It is upside down as it is, and then, of course, Joe Biden, maybe. As upside down as it has ever been in American politics, God bless them. The people have had enough. Well, it was supposed to be their first step to freedom from places like Syria, where they'd be killed. But now, thousands upon thousands of migrants are mired in despair, anger, and frustration in Western Europe. It's just a mess. They're on an island now, a Greek island. They're trying to get to mainland Greece so they can continue their journey. Uh, By the way, Germany has said they will take them in. That's where they're trying to go. I just have one other uh, quick note here at the beginning, and I want you to listen to this, and it doesn't sound overly strange. I get a lot of emails from people. This is from a French man from Quebec, and um, it's not really that strange, but it is. He said, Art, I had a strange encounter when I was about 21, back in 99. I was uh, working at a gas station, finishing my shift, when a family of four with two children, boy and a girl, came in. First glance, they seemed normal. But the children had blonde, darn near white hair. While I was looking at them, they both turned in my direction at the same time and stared at me in a silent but very intense way for about five seconds, but it felt much longer. They had big blue eyes with large pupils, and I mean one and a half to two times what we would consider normal. They had both the same height. Nobody in the store seemed to notice them after they left. The parents didn't look a bit like them. Brown hair, normal eyes. Have you ever heard of any story like this? Sorry for the spelling. I speak French. David. Um, and I don't know why that hit me. It just did. It's weird. And um, thank you, David. Maybe we'll get some feedback and proceed. Well, I'm not sure where we would proceed with something like that, but uh, maybe that's what we'll do. All right, coming up in a moment, uh, I know a lot of you have been awaiting David Pallides. He's here. David received his undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of San Francisco and has a professional background that includes 20 years in law enforcement and senior executive positions in the technology sector. In 2010, it seems a ranger at a national park informed him of a series of unusual disappearances that occurred in national parks, right? And this started an investigation into people that have vanished in national parks and forests. The result was uh, David has now written five books, all entitled Missing 411, Western U.S., Eastern U.S., North America, and Beyond. The Devils in the Details would be his latest, released August 30th, Missing 411, a sobering coincidence. So when we come back... David Polides, and uh, we'll get into all of this and so much more. 
a man that I should have talked to a long time ago, but um, I was sort of retired at the time. David Polides, welcome to the program. Pleasure to be here, Art. Thanks. Good to have you. Um, so, David, uh, I know you've made the uh, the talk show rounds and rounds and rounds and rounds. I don't know how many you've done. A lot, I guess, right? It's been going on about five years, and I've talked to all your uh, compatriots out there. <laughs> I'm sure you have. I unfortunately have not caught you. Um, I don't listen to other talk show hosts because I'm always scared that I'm going to pick up something from them and then subconsciously grab onto it and repeat it, and I don't want to do that. So I'm a neophyte um, in terms of, you know, I have a general idea of what you talk about, but if somebody was brand new like me, um, how would you start with them? I would say that uh, I was in a national park doing research on a peripheral topic one time. I was getting followed around the park by a couple of park rangers. I was interviewing contractors at the park about something else. At the end of the day, I left the park. A couple hours later, I get a knock on my door. It's one of those park rangers in plain clothes, and he says, Dave, I know who you are. Uh, I know your background, and I have some information that somebody like you ought to get a hold of. So I invited him in, spoke to him for several hours, and he stated that uh, during the last several rounds that he had been at different parks in his career, Rangers had talked about disappearing people, and he said that at the front end, there's always seven to ten days where there's a lot of exposure, a lot of press, a lot of big search efforts, and at the end of that period of time, there's nothing. There's no follow-up. There's no other effort to find the person. In fact, there's, there's nothing that they could find after that, and they themselves tried to find information about the people, and they were somehow restricted in getting much of the information they were looking for. And he said that the other part of it was that some of the locations that the people disappeared didn't make a lot of sense to him. And he said sometimes they disappear right in the middle of humanity in a park, and other times they disappear in the middle of nowhere, but there was no consistency that he could tell from it. Hmm. But the consistent part that he was concerned about, and other rangers he stated were concerned about, was the lack of follow-up, uh, the lack of effort after the people disappeared, the lack of accountability after they disappeared, etc. Okay, you were a cop? For 20 years, yeah. 20 years. Regular cop? Uh, I, I worked street crimes, detectives, SWAT okay. team, Okay, yeah. three Regu or four different detective units. Regular cop. All right. Uh, you said they were concerned about the lack of follow-up, right? Correct. When somebody disappears in a national park, um, jurisdictionally, who does it belong to? So the National Park Service has a group of between six and 700 full-time sworn law enforcement officers that are trained by the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. These people are very well trained, probably better than half the police officers in the United States. These people are full-time law enforcement rangers in the park carrying guns with the responsibility of law enforcement. They have a hierarchy inside the Park Service of chiefs, directors, assistant directors, etc. They understand policing very well. They understand the sense of accountability. Uh, they're a large organization, and you see them at the park every once in a while driving around. They write tickets. They make arrests, and they have a division inside of them called special agents. And the special agents are the detectives inside the park service that do the follow-up and the detective work. Okay, so and, they, they are, they're federal, right? Oh, Yes. So it is their jurisdiction. So nobody would come marching in from a local county or any other uh, jurisdiction at all, except maybe the FBI, I guess, who was bad enough. Yeah, and, and the FBI in some of these instances was invited in. But you're right, they hold the primary jurisdiction. Sometimes they do invite search and rescue organizations from counties and nearby jurisdictions to come in. Other times they don't let anybody in. So there's no consistency there, but you're correct in your assumption about jurisdiction. Okay, well then, if they were coming to you with concern about the lack of follow-up, why weren't weren't they looking in the mirror? There, I, I didn't understand that at the beginning, but then after I started to look into it, it becomes pretty obvious the mentality and kind of the approach with the Park Service. If you just Google search uh, National Park employees complaints, let's say, mm -hmm. there's there's a there's an aura inside that system that isn't healthy. 
And the way they treat their own employees is is pretty despicable. Um, just a quick story. There was a park ranger that disappeared in Arizona. He was never found. They refused to pay that, that ranger's wife his salary and his really? benefits, saying he just left the park. Well, he's really? never been found. And finally, she had to go to federal court to sue him for the benefits. Oh, my. Okay, so um, it, it sounds to me like the, the problem is inside of their policing organization. Absolutely. And, and what I tell every group that I speak to is that the frontline rangers that you see that are showing you around the park and helping you with botany and fisheries, et cetera, mm-hmm. they're salt-of-the-earth people. They are the best of the best, really nice, wholesome folks. This kind of mentality and the responses we got from our Freedom of Information Act requests are policies made by the high administration in the parks. Okay. All right. Well, now now here, I guess, is where you can tell me a couple of uh, the wilder stories. I, I would like to know what makes these disappearances um, so bizarre. So when we started this, we were trying to understand where the majority of these disappearances were occurring so we could focus an effort. So we filed a series of Freedom of Information Act requests against the Park Service, asking them for their list of missing people inside their system. Uh Seems like a natural, easy thing to go through. Well, several weeks later, I get a call from uh, an attorney inside the Park Service asking me why I wanted that information. Really? I, I, mean, I mean, why should you even have to file a Freedom of Information Act to get this information in the first place? You're singing to the choir here, Art. I'm with you 100%. <laughs> okay. All right. So anyway, forced to do it. You did it. And uh, knowing a little bit about the law... It, that's an inappropriate question to ask anybody. And in fact, in the Freedom of Information Act, it says that they can't ask that question and use it as a determining factor if they give you the information. And I asked them, I said, well, why are you even asking me? It's a mundane request. I'm just interested. And he goes, I need to know. I said, well, we're just doing research. Right. And, and he says, well, we don't have any lists. And I said, well, what do you mean you don't have any lists? And he says, we don't keep track of missing people inside our parks. And I said, how can that be? And he says, nope, we don't have any lists. Well, at the time, I was a published author. So I said, okay, I want an author's exemption because I'm published. I want the the list. And he says, well, we'll have to get back to you. With a a list that they don't have. Well, I'm I'm asking him to do the job now. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he said, we don't have a list. We don't keep lists, right? Right. So... About a month, month and a half later, I get another contact, this time from the regional coordinator out of Denver. And she tells me that, uh, well, Dave, I was told by our administration that your books aren't in enough uh, libraries to qualify for the exemption. (laughs) Okay. And I said, okay. Can can I just curiously ask how many libraries one has to be in to qualify? Oh, that's the million-dollar question. And they said, well... (laughs) That's their decision, Dave. That's not mine. And I was speaking from the Denver office. Okay. And so uh, from that point, I said, okay, well, then tell me how much money it's going to cost me to get the list from Yosemite and from your entire system. She goes, okay, I'll get back to you. Another four or five weeks come by. She calls me back and she says, Dave, well, the list from Yosemite is going to cost you $34,000. What? What? And the list from the entire system is going to be $1.4 million. What? Um, what are they faxing it in gold? <laughs> I already don't get this. Okay. Um, and, so, and, and I'm sure you said, uh, excuse me, how much and why? I, I didn't write a check. That's for sure. Good. But yeah. so that, that, that outlined us some, some important points and it was pretty obvious from the get go that they didn't want that information getting out. Apparently not. And in talking to some of the best journalists I could find, everyone said, Dave, they're outright lying. There's no way they don't keep track of missing people in their system. And I I tend to believe that because over the last six years now, people have sent me a series of lists that the Park Service keeps. One of them is a list of movies that have been filmed in the Western U.S. National Parks 
since the 1940s. Okay. So they find value in that, but they don't find value in knowing where missing people were located. I, I've got to back to, up and ask. I, I mean, it just blows my mind. How could the list cost that much? Surely you asked. Well, they told me that they it would take a, a supervisor earning $65 an hour uh, going to each one of these locations or them uh, contracting it out at these various locations, them going through their files and digging through their files trying to find missing persons cases. Boy, uh, that's just incredible, but okay. Um, okay, so did you finally secure a list or the list? Well, it's, it's a real slippery slope, Art, because after digging through the policies and procedures and how the National Park handles missing people, hmm. after 10 years, they have a category called missing presumed dead which technically, after 10 years, you're no longer missing. Right. Got it. Um, missing, presumed dead. All right. Um, so anyway, did we finally get a number of, of, of all categories? Missing, presumed dead, whatever else? No. No, they refused to, they refused to work it. And uh, I decided, along with a series of other people, that what we would do is we would, one by one, do the best we could going through archives and finding the number of missing people at the different locations, national parks, monuments, et cetera. Okay. And at this point, it, it branched out to also U.S. national force because a lot of things happen right on that periphery. And we're at about 1,600 people right now in North America. Wow. May I ask because, this? Um, if you, if th that would be your number of, you're thinking 1,600, yes? Oh, no. No. I no. mean, it's probably double or triple that, but... Okay. You know, All right. Here, here, our... here comes my question, anyway, uh, just for starters. If you take that number and you apply it to the number of people that visit our national parks um, uh, by percentage, and then you look at the North America, let's say, because we can probably get the stats best for North America and compare it to the number of people missing in North America uh, for any given year, do we see a difference? Well, first of all, the number would be infinitesimal compared to the number of people that visit the park. No, by percent. And, yes, yes, of course. But by percentage again. Uh, uh, again, I, I don't want to make that because we truly don't know. At this point, I'd be playing into their hands by giving you a number. Yeah, that's true. All right, uh, but but I was just trying to get a, a comparison or an idea if it's um, larger than the national average of people that go missing every year or not. What would be your so, guess? Oh, I'm sure it's way less because the numbers that you read about in the newspapers and the magazines and the FBI statistics are very skewed. That's true. If one runaway disappears from their house six times in a year, mm -hmm. that's six different missing people that go into the statistics in NCIC. Okay, that's true. So it's, it's a very skewed number. It's, the, it's only the number where it says suspicious unknown perpetrator, which is about 1.5% of all disappearances of missing people. Hmm. All right, uh, let's move on then uh, to what makes these disappearances so puzzling. So after reading thousands of reports and going over many, many articles and just grabbing anything we can, we started to find that certain things come out at you that are abnormal. And we first set the criteria at rural disappearances, mm -hmm. no suspects on the case, the person can have a history of mental illness. It can't be a voluntary disappearance. There's no evidence of an animal attack or human predation. And one of the biggies is lack of scent and uh, by the canines or the bloodhounds that came to the scene. They can't find a scent trail of the victim. Hmm. Many, many of the times, the victim, if they're found alive or deceased, they're missing clothing or shoes. 
Depending on the geographical area they disappeared, boulder fields and berries are involved. And soon after the victim disappears, bad weather is often associated with the disappearance. If the victim is found, they're often found near creeks, rivers, and bodies of water. And the majority of the incidents occur in a time frame between 4 to 5 p.m. or slightly later. <laughs> if the missing is located, they are often found unconscious or semi-conscious. And later on when they're questioned, the majority of the time, these victims can't remember what happened, where they went, or how they disappeared. Wow. In an, in an abnormal number of times, where a doctor or the parents talk about it, they talk about the person having a fever, a low-grade fever. Okay. And this is the one that will blow your mind. But the missing are most often found in an area that had been searched many, 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 many times before, <laughs> sometimes dozens of times. And bam, they're all of a sudden right there. All right. The well, you've, thing, you've, you've sort of moved it almost to the paranormal. I mean, with those facts alone, I'm not jumping to the paranormal. I'm just saying that. It seems impossible. Well, I'll keep going, and this, this will probably even draw you more there, but there's most, more often than not, there's two ends of the intellectual spectrum that are involved in these disappearances. There's a significant number of physicists, physicians, and super, super smart people that disappear, and many times they're never found. Really? A lot of times, people with significant autism, dementia, uh, impaired uh, ability to think, etc., they disappear, and oftentimes, if they're found, they can't explain what happened. Of course. And then one of the last things is that there's a geographical clustering of these people. There's 52 clusters of missing people in North America. And this is something that surprised us, because when you're dealing with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, you don't realize it until you put a map on the wall and start putting pins on it where they start to fall out. Interesting. So two um, ends of the scale of of the intellectual scale, and that's the, uh, the scientists you mentioned, very bright people, and then autistic people and people at the other end of the scale, but not so much in the middle. Middle people, middle ground like me, meh, it happens, but it doesn't happen, it seemed, to the frequency that we're looking at for these both ends. And that's, it's a strange paradox that we realized probably in the middle of the research. Well, important though, because of course it could, uh, it could go to motive. I mean, what do they want with people um, with these attributes? Oh, and I, I get emails about that all the time. People read the books and they say, well, you know, could it be this, this, this? I, a lot of great ideas but no evidence yet. Well, when the people do are, are found, whether they're deceased or alive, and they go through either an autopsy or they go through uh, a doctor's examination, the other thing on this is that many times the medical examiner, if they find the person, if we find them, they can't determine the cause of death, which is pretty strange. It's very strange. It does occur. I mean, it, sometimes... They are stumped, and they don't know what kills somebody, uh, but they know they do call it a natural death. Um. Dark Matter News. I'm Leo Ashcraft. A new photo is causing quite a stir online as it depicts what appears to be a blue, luminous angel floating in the smoke above a church in Ohio. And this interesting story comes to us from Dark Matter News staff writer Kingslayer. The night was alight in Ohio last week as a suspicious fire ripped through Faith Church on Old Chillicothe Road in Fayette County. Flames licked 20 feet into the air, and heat of the fire combined with a hot, humid night made it especially difficult for firefighters as they battled the blaze into the late night and early morning. But during the chaos, Brett Nicely said his son snapped a photograph that appears to show an angel-like figure hovering just above the fire. Offering some sort of explanation for the Blue Angel, Joshua Hobbs said it could either be a high-powered flashlight or possibly an optical illusion brought on by a mixture of high heat and the metal materials that were in the church structure itself. Finally, though, in commenting on the angel theory, Dobbs said this, 
Bibles always survive the worst fires, so I won't question anything in terms of the church. I wouldn't put anything past that possibility. So anyway, check out the picture. Let us know what you think. Is it a flashlight? Heat? Metal? Or was there a divine hand at play? Take a look. Darkmatternews.com. Campers near the Cuervo region of Russia woke up to an astonishing sight. Denis Alexandrov and his friends were enjoying the hiking trails inside of Shorsky National Park when they noticed something unusual in the wet clay. Curious, his father, Andre, decided to venture over and investigate. He says they went over to the place where the kids saw the footprint. And the only thing I can say was, I know it exists. The creature must have been very tall. According to the Siberian Times, the print measured approximately 18 inches in length. Skeptics of the image point out that the creature's footprint appears too clean to reveal distinguishing lines or marks, as if it were created by an adult foot through a sliding motion in the mud. The shape of the toe pattern also appears similar to the shape of toes of an adult. Yes, the search for the elusive Yeti continues. No hair, tissue samples, or imprints of the foot were known to have been collected at the site, Samples that have been collected at other sites around the region have been DNA tested. One sample allegedly belonged to a horse, and the other two samples belonged to an American black bear. Still, Bigfoot enthusiasts claim that anywhere from 30 to 200 could roam in southern Siberia. Let us know if you have any further information to add to this story. What do you think it could be? Have you witnessed a Bigfoot? Let us know at darkmatternews.com. According to reports, an estimated 30 cadets were injured in a hazing ritual at West Point Military Academy in New York. The cause? A pillow fight. Injuries ranged from bruises to concussions and reported by 24 of the 30 cadets. As bloody images emerged, reports of broken bones did as well. The pillows allegedly contained hard objects. This is not your average pillow fight. Though images and video had circulated on social media when the alleged event took place on August 20th, investigators just confirmed the incident last Thursday. No cadets have been punished, though West Point has been questioned about similar issues in the past. The annual ritual, said to have been implemented in 1897, will continue as the school has no plans to break tradition over the incident. All cadets have reported again for duty. Part of King Kamehameha's spear is missing. Police on Hawaii's Big Island are asking the public for help locating the top section of the spear that's part of the statue of the Hawaiian warrior Hilo. Police say the spear was last seen Saturday and was reported missing Sunday. The bronze spear with a golden tip is about six feet long. Kamehameha I is known for uniting the Hawaiian Islands in 1810. I'm Leo Ashcraft. Dark Matter News. Don't we? David Polides is my guest, and um, I must admit he's laid down a... A uh, sobering list of uh, things to shake your head at. Um, all these people going missing in national parks uh, and not much follow-up within the national park organization uh, with regard to what happened to them. Um, all right. Welcome back, uh, David. Um, I live here in the desert, uh, and I mean serious desert, you know, cactus and very serious. Temperature goes up typically to 110, 112 or higher during the summer. And inevitably, every summer, uh, people with no prior uh, history of mental illness uh, simply decide to wander out into the desert where they inevitably die. Uh, so I guess it is reasonable to ask if... Um, if something like that could be going on with respect to the national parks as well, if you were if you decided to take your own life for whatever rational or irrational reason you might have, a national park would be a pretty place to do it. Yes. Sure, but uh, if there's ever any inclination that that person had a mental illness or was about to commit suicide, it wouldn't be one of the cases that we considered or wrote about. Okay. Well, not all suicide is irrational necessarily. I mean, that's subjective, but, you know, if you've got something wrong with you, then, of course, it's it's a likelihood. Uh, another, another thing that occurred to me that I want to ask you about is the possibility, and I haven't actually heard the details of any of these cases yet, and I want to do that, but uh, does any of this lead you to the conclusion that we could be dealing with a serial killer or even a series of serial killers? So if I could just back up a little bit, when when you talk about people who want to commit suicide, 
there's there's large numbers in the books that I write about that are very young children. And and so that issue of suicide or voluntary disappearance is kind of washed away. And if you remember that if you just stick to those profile points I gave you, mm-hmm. uh, no scent, they bring in professional trackers, there's no mm-hmm. track that they can find, um, they have, people doesn't call, the people don't call for help. It's like they have vanished completely. There, there is no track to follow. There is no scent. Sometimes the canines will walk in a circle and lay down. <laughs> Sometimes they look at the trail and they just don't want anything to do with it. No, but, David, I'm with you. Um, I mean, everything you've laid down leads me toward the paranormal. I'm trying to sort of back up and see if there's any other thing that might make sense. Um, you know, a serial killer, of course, doesn't make sense. And there would be scents and there would be tracks and there would be a lot of things. So, you know, I'm with you. I'm just reaching. Well, and, and, and that's logic. And when I tell a group of people, this is where everybody goes in that comfort place in your mind trying to rationalize this away. And the first thing is, well, could it be a serial killer on the trail? Well, I live in Colorado and I, I, I'm, my guess is probably 80% of the people on the trail carry a gun. So I've never heard of somebody trying to abduct somebody on the trail because there'd be a firefight and there'd be dead people laying there. Very good point. Very good and, point. And the other thing is, is that what do you do with somebody who's five foot ten, weighs 200 pounds? You're not going to carry him very far on a trail. No. No, you're not. Uh, maybe you bury them. You know, I don't know. Um You've set up a series of things that, again, leads right back to the paranormal because it's all so impossible. Can you give me a couple of specifics? Uh, You know, you've documented these cases, so if you reach back for one of them or the most puzzling cases you can find, give me a couple of them. Well, let's start with some this summer that happened that are right on key. Uh, Talk about Grand Canyon National Park. And there was a, a group of people going down the river with a tour company floating down the Colorado. Right. They were about four or five days in, and they always stop at this one place that has a small creek that flows into the Colorado. They let everybody get out. They walk up this creek, not very far, a couple hundred yards, and there's a waterfall that goes into this deep pond. People jump off the rock into the little water pool and... And then they all walk back after a couple hours to the boats, and they go further down the river. Well, Morgan Heimer was one of the tour guides, and he was in his first year from the University of Wyoming, 22 years old, a stellar kid. June 2nd, 2015, the group stops four or five days in, far outside the normal bounds of the park. I mean, they were really deep in there. And the group gets out, and they walk up to this pool. They have fun. And Morgan is the last person in line as they're walking back. He's wearing his life preserver. He's carrying a water bottle. And the creek is so small that people said you could wade across it without it coming up to your waist. Make a long story short, everyone gets back. Morgan doesn't come back. Someone from that company called me and told me the the details that I'm telling you now that a lot of it didn't become public. But they said that they were absolutely baffled what happened to him because it makes no sense that he could go anywhere. Canyon walls were steep. Uh, they got out their satellite phone. They called for help. Next That night late, the National Park Service shows up. They search for a few days. They don't find anything. He's never been found. Now, Roger Marsh from MUFON read a couple of my books, and he wrote an article for the Huffington Post called don't be last in line <laughs> because <laughs> many of the stories in my books involve people that are last in line or first in line on a hike and, and get out of sight momentarily and disappear and are gone. <laughs> um, okay. If you're a serial killer, that's how you're going to pick somebody off. You're going you're gonna to wait for the last guy in line. Now, again, I know you're going to recite everything you've recited, and and I'm going to agree with you. Uh, but indeed, that's how that's what you would do. You wouldn't pick somebody in the middle. Then you got a fight on your hands, right? Well, 
and I can only go case by case with you, but in this sure. instance, there are so many miles from anybody. Nobody is even in the area, and there's no way to walk into that area with, without walking in for days to get to the specific location. Was Morgan ever found? No. No bones? No, no, nothing that could yield up the DNA and says, you know, that says this is Morganheimer. Nothing has ever come up. They, uh, I'm sure that they went to his parents and got some DNA material to put in a database. But at this point, happened June second, two thousand fifteen. Gone. That's weird. Really weird. Uh, if somebody had grabbed grabbed him, I mean, they they weren't that far apart in the line, were they? Um, you know, I ask you know, that because I, you, you'd grunt, you'd scream, you'd do something if somebody grabbed you. Absolutely you would. And that's another thing. There's a complete absence of any yells for help, calls for help in these cases that we're talking about right now. Mm-hmm. Now, some of the other things that have happened over the years, there is some indication that something really strange is going on okay. because the person happened to be on the phone with another individual at the time they disappeared. Wow. In these cases that we're talking about right here, there's nothing. Okay. That one's weird, all right. Somebody uh, who has heard you in previous shows, I guess, elsewhere, asks, please ask David about the condition of the feet. Uh, what condition the feet are in when these people are found? They are often found without their shoes, though miles and miles away from the last known position over very rough terrain. Well, that's that's a million dollar question that I ask myself all the time. And the reality is, is that you've you've got to understand the mentality of the search and rescue people. Okay. They don't think anything strange is going on. They don't think anything unusual has happened. They just think the person's missing. And many times the news broadcast will show somebody walking back with no shoes and nobody ever thinks to ask them what happened or thinks to say, how did you lose your shoes? The question is not asked because these people are not criminal investigators. They're not thinking along the lines that you and I are right now. And I don't blame them for that because search and rescue people, 95% of them are volunteers. They could be engineers. They could be human resource people. They could be anything, but they're just, there looking for people and they're just so happy that they found them. That's the end of the game. In a national park, assuming you got separated and or lost, the last thing you would take off would be your shoes because obviously you're stepping on all kinds of things that can harm you, so that doesn't make any sense at all. Okay, um, a jump-ahead question. Since all this publicity, you've had book after book, and I wonder how the National Park Service has reacted to the publicity you've generated. I can tell you that uh, we're in the middle right now of making a film about a number of these disappearances. And we met a family at uh, Mesa Verde National Park, and they told us a story about their dad who disappeared. And while we were in the park, we were with the victim's family. And they wanted us to interview the chief park ranger and the superintendent about the disappearance. Right. And these people went to the front desk, and those two individuals would not even come to the front desk and talk to those people. Hmm. They had an assistant come up and said, well, they're unavailable. And they said, well, when can we talk to them? Well, they're not available right now. And that type of mentality towards a victim's family when they lost their dad in that park was absolutely unbelievable. Well... Was it your name that got the inattention? We hadn't even been in there. We were standing outside, and they walked in. All right, then let me, circle, the let, yeah, let me circle back to the question. Since you've written these books, um, with respect to you, how uh, has the National Park Service been treating you? They can't be happy. Well, no. I mean, uh, we continue to file Freedom of Information Act requests for reports on missing people inside mm. their park. Right. They classified me last year as what's called a commercial requester. 
Hmm. I've never heard that before. And because of that, they quadrupled the fees that they would charge the normal public for aye, aye, anything aye. I wanted. Huh. As an example, there was an incident where a park ranger disappeared in Rocky Mountain National Park, disappeared for 10 days. He was found dead. I made a request for that report. They said it was going to cost me $7,500. Oh, my God. Uh, what, whatever happened to law enforcement cooperation? Oh, that's, that's a really good question. Um, we were actually at Rocky Mountain National Park on a peripheral issue, and I'm in this little satellite office on the way up to one of the mountain climbing sites, and I see a, a table with four individuals, older guys, sitting around talking, and they talk like they were, they were cops, but they were all in plain clothes. And I, said, I told the, my friend I was with, I said, hey, we're waiting right here. I'm not going anywhere. i got to talk to one of these guys. Mm-hmm. One of them walks out. I meet him in the parking lot. I introduce myself. He goes, oh, my name is so-and-so. I'm a retired special agent from the Park Service. I'm thinking, oh, I hit the glory hole right here. We ended up talking for a couple hours in the parking lot, and I explained all the, all the issues I'd had with the Park Service and how they had obstructed, delayed, done everything they could. Mm-hmm. And I said, how do you account for that? And he said, Dave, it's very easy. He says, a complete lack of integrity. And, and he went in and, and he told me a story about an investigation he was doing into a park superintendent about high criminal felony case. And he was got a call from Washington, just said, just drop it, leave it alone, walk away. And he goes, Dave, that's the way the Park Service works. Um, and the answer to the, to the question, why is it's corrupt? He didn't, he didn't really go into that. He just explained it in very simple terms that don't be offended because it's probably not you per se, but it's just the way they do business. And he said, you're never probably going to get that information out of them regarding missing people because they don't want you to have it. All right. Um, how weird uh does it really get? I mean, uh, go ahead and hit me with a couple of other cases. I'm. You would think that um, with some of the weirdness you're describing, it would have uh, caused other investigators, paranormal type people at this point, to jump in and begin investigating and looking for signs of Bigfoot or some Wolfman or God knows what. Uh, so... Proceed. I, I'm, I'm told you have a lot of cases, and I'm, I'm interested in how weird they really are. So why haven't other people looked at this? Something called plausible deniability, meaning in our world, we've been, we've been told it's normal for people to go down a trail and disappear and never be found. <laughs> really? Well, and that's, that's kind of the way it goes, because you only hear about these people for a couple days, a couple of reports, once they're missing and they're never found, you never hear about it. Well, maybe and, it's normal on TV. You know, the last guy in the line disappears, just gets snatched away. It doesn't happen that way in real life, only you're saying it does. So uh, talk about another case this year, June 9th, 2015, okay. Chiricahua National Monument, jurisdiction of the National Park Service, a 44-year-old woman with the mental capacity of a five-year-old is with her dad, who's a physician, and her mom. They're in the motorhome of their dad. They stop at the monument, and the girl gets out with her mom, and they go to the restroom. The mom go, is, goes to the restroom, and so does the girl. The girl leaves early to go back to the motorhome. The dad's waiting there, not far away. She never comes back. Mom comes back. They said, well, let's look around. They look around. They can't find her. They call for a National Park Ranger, and a search starts. Sure. Now, what's interesting about, first of all, her name was Janet Castrojan. She's never been found. That was this year, June 9th. What's interesting about this, this is the same location. In January 13, 1980, the only National Park Ranger to ever disappear on duty and never be found, Paul Fugate disappeared. Really? Okay, so she's mentally impaired, you've, you've already said. One would imagine she could have wandered away. 
one would not imagine she'd get very far and that um, if something awful happened, uh, fell, if she fell or whatever, obviously she would be found. Absolutely. They bring in a series of canines and bloodhounds from different search and rescue organizations, and they all say, we can't find a scent trail. <laughs> and the dogs had something to start with, uh, some article of clothing or something that they could, uh, you know, grab the scent from and then go look. Absolutely. That is really, really weird. And the park ranger, what about him? He's presumably something of a survivalist himself uh, or have some of those skills, yes? Uh, I, I don't. I wouldn't call him a survivalist at all. In fact, he was probably more the uh, more the urban park ranger. Really? Uh, yeah. He, he. You know. He. Everything I read about him in the file. Now I did get a file on him. It was about eight inches thick, and they did a huge investigation on him. And there were allegations at the beginning that it was a voluntary disappearance. And that, like I said, this is the case where they refused to give his widow any benefits at all. She had to get an attorney and sue him in federal court and finally to make him pay. It was unbelievable when you read the story. But uh, no, he's never been found. Not not anything at all? Not an article of clothing? Not bones? Not anything? Nothing. I um, I don't see how that can be. Well, he, he walked off on a trail, was supposedly going to go check on something. Mm -hmm. Reports said that uh, it was late in the afternoon. People saw him leave. He left. They went and searched the area later. They found nothing. <laughs> um, yeah, that that is uh, it, it's just not within my realm of understanding to... I'm going to have to try and process this. All right, David Polides is my guest.